Well, hey guys, get excited. In this video, we're gonna be going over the results of a recent study that ranks hair loss treatments, different medications for hair loss. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Andrea. I'm a board certified dermatologist. I upload skincare and quite a bit of hair care content here on YouTube. If that is of interest to you, consider subscribing, hit the bell notification. That lets you know when my videos go live. If you prefer short form content, make sure and follow me over on TikTok or Instagram. I'm pretty consistent on those platforms too. Androgenetic alopecia is a type of hair loss that commonly affects both men and women. It's frequently referred to as pattern hair loss, like male pattern baldness or female pattern hair loss. And it basically has to do with a sensitivity of the hair follicle to the androgen hormones. There's an enzyme in our hair follicle that converts testosterone to a more potent form of testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. And that is what is responsible for converting the hair into a baby hair, resulting in decreased hair density, thickness, and ultimately thinning out of the hair and balding. And there are medications that target the enzyme 5-alpha reductase to treat pattern hair loss. These include, the most commonly prescribed for male pattern hair loss is finasteride. But there's a similar compound, dutasteride. It is prescribed less frequently, but we're gonna see how it stacks up in this video. Now, in addition to finasteride and dutasteride, there is minoxidil, probably what you're most familiar with. This is used in both men and women commonly. You can buy it in the drugstore. It is a topical treatment that you put on the scalp. We don't actually know how it works, but there are some ideas. It appears to increase blood flow, stimulating restoration of the hair follicles, getting the hairs to go into the growing phase. There's also oral minoxidil, a pill that you take by mouth. It's actually a blood pressure medication, but at low, low doses, it helps to treat hair loss in both men and women. If you're curious about minoxidil oral, make sure you check out my video on it. I go into detail. I'll link it down below. If you're not familiar with finasteride, it is a medication that is most used to treat male pattern hair loss. It works, again, by inhibiting that enzyme 5-alpha reductase, and it's relatively effective. However, there are some side effects that can occur. It can lead to mood changes, depression, and it also can cause a sexual dysfunction, poor libido, erectile dysfunction, and in some cases, gynecomastia, which is the development of breast tissue in men. The depression with finasteride is interesting. It appears to be dose independent, so it doesn't matter the dose of finasteride. Um, some people do go on to develop mood changes, including depression. It's thought to be related to a lowering of something called neurosteroid allopregnanolone, which is a hormone that is thought to have natural antidepressant effects. When you go on 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, that can lower that, and that may be associated with the depression symptoms in some people. It doesn't happen in everyone. It's more common, actually, in men under the age of 45. Finasteride should also be used with caution in people who have underlying liver disease as it is metabolized through the liver. It's FDA approved to treat male pattern hair loss, but what about using it in women? Can it be prescribed for female pattern hair loss? It can. Unfortunately, it is absolutely contraindicated if a woman plans to become pregnant because it does cause birth defects, but it is used off-label, meaning it's not FDA approved, but we try it out anyway. It is used off-label in some women. Because finasteride does disrupt the balance between estrogen and testosterone in women, it could, in theory, slightly increase the risk for breast cancer. So if there's a family history of breast cancer, you know, you may be counseled against using it. What about dutasteride? Similar medication to finasteride inhibits that 5-alpha reductase enzyme. What about that? That's mostly been used in men and it's not as commonly used. It still can cause low libido and it still can cause erectile dysfunction, mood changes, but the side effect profile is not as well described as for finasteride in terms of treating androgenetic alopecia. And dutasteride also can cause gynecomastia, just like finasteride. And then there's minoxidil, which you guys, you know, I've got a lot of videos on minoxidil, something that you put on the scalp. We don't know entirely how it works, but it does have some side effects. It can be very irritating. In the beginning, it causes the hairs to shed. That's expected, but it can be very annoying to deal with. And then the hairs start growing after around three months. And as soon as you stop it, the hair that you grew while you were on minoxidil will just fall out and you kind of go back to where you would have been had you never used it. So people get frustrated with it because it's something you have to put on 
every day and you have to use it pretty much indefinitely and you go through the shedding phase which is frustrating that being said there is a oral pill version of it that is actually pretty effective especially when used at low doses at the lower doses it's effective but there are fewer side effects because minoxidil is a blood pressure medication one of the side effects that you would be worried about is low blood pressure it's not as much of a risk factor though at the lower doses. Other adverse effects that can occur with taking oral minoxidil include excessive hair growth. Uh, and so when we're talking about treating women with oral minoxidil, you're talking about hair growth where you don't want it, facial hair growth, and that's not desirable. And at very high doses, it can cause heart problems. It can cause fluid around the heart. And then there is actually topical finasteride that you can apply to the scalp. And that's actually showing some really good results. And We'll get into, into that in a moment. And the advantage there is that less risk of side effects in comparison to taking finasteride by mouth. Now, aside from finasteride, dutasteride, and minoxidil, there are a variety of other treatments that are offered for either men or women going through androgenetic alopecia. I've got a lot of videos on one of my favorite adjuncts, uh, low-level laser therapy. That certainly can be really helpful um, to use alongside these treatments or in those who don't care for minoxidil. I mean, it's a great option. And in women, there's also the oral medication spironolactone. So I've got a specific video all on spironolactone. I'll link that down below. But the study we're gonna be talking about today, it was a meta-analysis analysis done pretty recently. And this meta-analysis, it was looking to determine kind of the rank order of efficacy for finasteride, both oral and topical, as well as zutasteride, and oral and topical minoxidil at a few different doses. So the meta-analysis include, included 23 studies, 21 of which were randomized control trials, and it included men only. So this is only looking at efficacy in men, ages 22, to around 41, so young men. And they looked at endpoints of number of hairs per centimeter square of surface area. So they're doing hair counts. They did hair counts at 24 and 48 weeks. At 24 weeks, dutasteride, half a milligram per day was a clear cut winner with much greater hair counts per centimeter square in comparison to the other treatments. 23.7 more versus minoxidil, 0.25 milligrams per day taken by mouth. Uh, dutasteride beat out minoxidil half a milligram per day by 15 hairs per centimeter square. Dutasteride 0.5 milligrams per day beat out 2% minoxidil solution applied to the scalp by eight and a half hairs per day. And it beat out uh, finasteride one milligram per day by 7.1 hairs per centimeter square. So it appears as though at 24 weeks, dutasteride was adv advantageous. As far as oral minoxidil, at 24 weeks, the higher dose was better. So five milligrams per day got better results than 0 0.25 milligrams per day. 43.6 hair hairs per centimeter square difference. That is actually very substantial between those two doses. And at 24 weeks, five milligrams per day of minoxidil was superior to one milligram per day of finasteride. And that's important too, because in young men who maybe have risk factors for an underlying mood disorder, depression, or maybe they're concerned about the impact on libido, oral minoxidil may be a better option for them. Um, and it appears as though it's actually more effective at this earlier time point than oral finasteride at one milligram per day. But overall, how did these stack up against one another? We're gonna rank them right now from worst to best. Um, the worst was the 0.25 milligrams per day of oral minoxidil. Number six was 2% topical minoxidil, so the minoxidil you apply to your scalp. Number five was 5% uh, topical minoxidil, so you got a little bit better with the 5%. Number four was one milligram per day of oral finasteride. Number three was five milligrams per day of oral minoxidil. So five milligrams a day of minoxidil is better than one milligram a day of finasteride. Number two was five milligrams per day of oral finasteride. And the number one was actually the five milligrams per day of dutasteride. So it seems as though dutasteride 
is the superior option. Now there's some limitations here with how the study was done. Hair counts per centimeter square. So it's not giving you a complete picture of the hair loss and it's looking at certain areas of the scalp. So it doesn't really give you an idea overall and it doesn't necessarily take into account hair thickness. It's just hair count, which is a, you know, something else that's really important for people because you can have very thin downy hairs, but that may not be the goal that you're looking for. So why might dutasteride be more effective than these other treatments? Possibly related to its uh, longer half-life. Dutasteride has a pretty long half-life of five weeks versus six hours for finasteride. So it stays in the system much longer. What about topical finasteride? Did they take that into account? Yes, they did. Interestingly, topical finasteride was similar to one milligram per day of oral finasteride. So that's important. You know, I get a lot of comments from men who are not, you know, they want to avoid taking finasteride by mouth. They want to know how topical stacks up. This meta analysis suggests that 1% finasteride applied to the scalp is as effective as one milligram per day of oral finasteride. Again, with the limitations in this study and the fact that we're only looking out to um, 48 weeks. So it doesn't really give you a picture long-term how they stack up. But if you're somebody who is looking to maybe avoid the risks of impact on libido, gynecomastia, um, mood changes, especially if you have a history of mood problems, you're under the age of 45, you may really wanna to talk to your doctor about the option for topical finasteride over the oral pill. What about in women? You know, this study was all looking at data in males. What about in women? We don't really have the comparative studies in women. Can we assume that the same will hold true for women? We can. Female pattern hair loss, while the effects of 5-alpha reductase and testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, likely do play a role, it may not be the only driving factor when it comes to female pattern hair loss. But these treatments, they are effective options for women. And how they stack up to one another in women, unfortunately, we don't have that information. Women who have high levels of androgens and they have a lot of skin and hair complications like acne, hirsutism, hair loss. Oral finasteride is certainly an option. Honestly, I haven't seen much in the way of topical finasteride for women. But that's definitely an interesting avenue to consider in the future. It'd be great if we had this kind of information on female pattern hair loss that also included the medication spironolactone, which helps to treat female pattern hair loss as well. But we don't, um, we just have this newer meta-analysis, which I think does shed a lot of light on how these medications stack up. At the end of the day, it's really about balancing some of the risks to benefit profile, and that's gonna vary from person to person. Like I said, if you have a history of mood disorders, or you're concerned about developing gynecomastia if you're a male, um, or you're worried about libido effects if you're a male, you may want to shy away, you know, you may be interested in shying away from oral finasteride. And this study would suggest that at least the one milligram per day dosage of oral finasteride, you can get similar results with the topicals. For those of you who are motivated to use the over-the-counter minoxidil, this meta-analysis further illustrates that 5% gets you results faster, better hair counts than the lower percentages. Now, that is in men. In contrast with women, we do know that 2% minoxidil, women tend to respond better to that than men do. Men need the higher, the higher minoxidil. Now, when it comes to topical minoxidil, it actually requires an enzyme to convert it to its active form. The enzyme it resides in the hair follicle. Some people don't have adequate levels of that, so they are very poor responders to minoxidil. These folks often add on like low-level laser therapy to get better results, or they, you know, they end up bailing on minoxidil. It's just not a good option for them. So that's another thing to, to factor in. Like, are you a minoxidil non-responder or do you get good results with minoxidil and you don't mind using it? All right, you guys, I hope this video was helpful and kind of sharing with you guys the latest research, kind of rank ordering these different medications. Again, this is not by any means a comprehensive list of treatments for androgenetic alopecia. Definitely check out my videos on minoxidil, on spironolactone for female pattern hair loss, 
and on low level laser therapy and other hormonal therapies for female pattern hair loss that were not included in this meta analysis. And again, to reiterate, the analysis was done taking research papers and research studies that were using men as participants. So whether or not these findings translate to women, we can't really say. But I do have a, you know, a male audience too, so I know a lot of you guys watch me for hair-related content. So I hope this was informative to you. Let me know in the comments if you have tried any of these medications with your doctor. And um, I know they're really popular nowadays. There are a lot of direct-to-consumer services that provide these medications after seeing, you know, having a telehealth visit. Let me know if that is something you have utilized. On the end slate, I'm going to put my video on hair loss treatments that actually work. So check that out if you are dealing with pattern hair loss. But if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends. And as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Bye.